Hey guys, Kyler Callahan here. Welcome to the actual marketing show where I talk to business leaders about their marketing strategies and what actually works for them. Entrepreneurs are bombarded daily with the latest marketing tactics. So when they try one out, they're often met with failure. So I thought, why not go to the source? Why not talk to actual hardworking business leaders in the trenches and battling it out daily to find out what works for them and what doesn't. Okay, let's get to it. Today I'm having Don Sevsek on the show. He is the founder of Math Celebrity. And he has achieved 3.8 million unique visitors from 235 countries to his site. And his site can solve math problems from grade two to college in one third of a second. And that's the blink of an eye. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, so we have him on the show here today and we're gonna talk to him about math celebrity and, and how he gets all these unique visitors to his website and what he does with them. Um, so how's it going today, Don? Good. It's a beautiful day today. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to have you on the show. We've been in communication for a while, and I think our first episode, we had to reschedule, you know, overbooked or something, right? So it happens. And uh, yeah, I know. So I was finally happy to have you on the show here today. And, you know, I, I look at what you've, what you've done. You've built up this, this website that helps people with their math problems and you know, and that's the thing too, is, is you give away so much, uh, so much freely. I mean, anybody can use his website and, and go there and uh, solve their, their problems. It even, even, it even breaks it down, right? And shows you how you got to the answer, right? So, so people can, you know, it's not just a, a calculator, right? A big fancy calculator. It actually shows you how to, to solve the problem. So um what was uh kind of your inspiration for setting up mass celebrity and getting and starting this website and this business about 13 years ago i was working uh, one of those corporate day jobs i was getting bored and i was looking for something more out of my life and we we at the time i, I branched out and started tutoring some students in math on the side just to make some extra cash and see what else was out there and anyway, one student turned into two, two turned into four, four turned into five. And pretty soon I, I was running out of time with a day job and a, and a family to balance it all. So I didn't want to give it up, but I didn't know how to scale. So as luck would have it back in my day job, I was a programmer and we had to teach a team in India about American pension plan laws. And so the original leader of the project sent the team in India, like a 150 page manual on everything about American pensions. And as you can imagine, that put them to sleep pretty quick. <laughs> so it, they just they just weren't getting it. So after a week, I, it dawned on me, like, why don't I put what's known on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet? So I started building the spreadsheet with formulas to calculate the numbers and walk them through the pension plan. And then, it, and then I thought of, well, how, how could I explain this even better? What if I show the math in the cells in, in a spreadsheet changing when the numbers change? and have the step-by-step -step math to kind of walk them through it. So I built that in a couple of days. I sent it back to the team in India and, and instantly they got it. They were thrilled and they started using that as the guide instead of the, the manual that was sent. So after that project, the light bulb went off and I said, well, wait a second, if I can do this for American pension plans, why can't I do this for my students? And so in July of 2007, the, the website started. Wow, yeah, that's cool. So you, you saw a problem uh, and, and you develop this Excel, Excel spreadsheet and then you say, well, I can, I'm sure there's other people out there that this would be really helpful for. So you scaled that up. Yeah. No, that's right. really cool. You know, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of times, uh, people come up with these business ideas and it's, you know, people say, oh, how, how do you come up with such a great idea? And it, I don't think it's always just one day it clicks in your head and you're like, oh, let's do this. Or you sit there and think real hard. I think there's something you see and you're like, oh, I think I could make that uh, go further. So it sounds like that's kind of like what you did there. Exactly. Uh, so now today, Mass Celebrity, what's kind of, uh, how does it all work? Like what's, what's your um, overview of, uh, of, what it, of what you do there with it? So the quick description, my elevator speech is it's a Google for math. So you enter your math problem, you push the button, and in one third of one second, the computer will show you the step-by-step -step line of work, the explanation, and then how to get to the answer. And what's nice about that is it's just like Google in that you don't have to install any software. You just open the website, 
get in the search box, click and go. So it's basically two clicks and you're, you're getting help. And what's nice about that is it's, it goes back to my tutoring days, but it takes what I know and my way of solving problems and scales it into almost unimaginable levels. So that, that was the fun part about building this. Yeah. And, and I've, I've used it a couple times that, you know, we're, me and my wife have decided we're going to homeschool our children this year. And, uh, you know, we got to teach the math and I mean, they're great too. So it can be too hard, but you know, it, it's, uh, really interesting you go put in your your, uh, your equation and, and you get this breakdown and you say okay well that's how I can kind of explain it to them and, and show them how it calculated it and, and even for parents you know especially parents who have children in high school or some of this math you haven't done in years and it's complicated you can go in there and put it in and, and, and understand what you're trying to help them with right because <laughs> right I, I know that would have been helpful for my own mother because sometimes I bring these books home and she'd be like i have no idea how to help you with this uh, let's let's try to figure this out and you beat it for hours but your calculator there would have probably been quite useful back in the day <laughs> yeah we get that a lot from the parents and it's funny because when people when you and i were talking a couple of weeks ago about sales and marketing it dawned on me and i've been doing this for 13 years but it took probably 10 or 11 to realize what i was really selling and what i was really giving it's not math tutoring it's confidence and it's, and it's uh, certainty because a portion of our audience that we've surveyed that comes to our site doesn't necessarily need help from math. What they want is that certainty. They want to know that, okay, did I get the answer right? And then some people will take it a step further and say, maybe I got the answer right, but is math celebrity doing this more efficiently and quicker than I am? And if so, how can I adopt, how can I model that process? So it's been a really fun experiment to see the different reasons why people use my site. And I think, I think I've seen, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw on there too, your site will show you different ways to get to the same problem, right? On, on some of those. Right. We do. So in, in the States, there's this math called common core and a lot of parents that are obviously like 40, 50 and older that learn the traditional way, they're, they're having a really tough time with this. And so a couple summers ago, I had some parents come to me and say, hey, we, we love the site, but can you build the common core way to solve it? And so what I did is if there's a, a way to solve both the way we learn, which is traditional, and the common core method, I will put two buttons and the parent or student can pick which way they want to solve it, and then they can compare them. Because I think the big struggle is people who are really smart in math but use the traditional method, that have had their hands tied and been basically force fed common core, they're really struggling with that because it's like, if you have a good way of solving a problem, it's tough for people to unlearn that and go find another method to solve the problem. Yeah, I hear that a lot too, even, even here in Canada. Uh, you know, I've seen sometimes a friend's kid, kid brings home this math and they're like, dude, you gotta check this math out. I don't understand it. Do you understand it? And I look and I, I don't know what they're doing there to get to that answer. Cause I think I was kind of in that traditional model, right. On, on, on how to do math. And you look at that and it's like, you need an explanation, I think before of what they are doing to understand what they're doing. Right. It's just kind of this, I, I can't even put into words exactly what they're doing. I have no idea. And I've never actually went and tried to figure out that uh, new method of, of doing math, but I'm, I'm sure when my kids get to that, the stage I'll be having to figure it out and mass celebrity would be quite helpful. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely very, uh, um, useful to everybody. Cause it, it, I guess he'd bring you, if, if you, it'll show you the traditional method and then you can see how that, uh, translates over to the new method. Right. So helpful for people to kind of wrap their head around it. Right. It's um, just another way of, finding another way to solve the problem. The one thing though I wish that schools would do is give the students the option. So you could solve it any way you want so long as you get the right answer and your work justifies it. And I mean, I've, I've went and spoke to schools before and, my, and my, my argument for that is, you know, when you go into the workforce, when school's done and you get a job, your boss really doesn't care if you're gonna take a day job. Your boss doesn't care how the job gets done. They just want the job to get done. They're not going to tell you, you have to use common core to solve this, or you have to use the traditional method. And I mean, you own a business, I do too. So it's the same goes when satisfying your clients. They really don't care 
how you do it. They just want to know that there's an end result that's going to make their life better. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'm pretty sure if you were working, you know, if you're at work and you're trying to do longhand math and you're like, man, there's a calculator right there. Just get it <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, this is some very uh, scientific uh, job and you need to show your work so that other people can peer review it or something, right? But yeah, I guess we kind of went a bit into why you started it, but this is just one of those questions. Maybe you have a bit more you can add to it, but um, you know, what's your why? Why did you decide to go this route and start Mass Celebrity? You know, how much your story? Yeah, so at my day job, I mean, when I first got in the corporate workforce, it was kind of a, a big culture change for me. And I didn't play the game well. And one of my, one of my personality flaws, which actually is a, is a huge asset in, in the entrepreneur game is impatience. So, you know, when you're dealing with people and when you're, when you're dealing with meetings, impatience really is not a good trait, but it turned out to be a huge asset for me and the people that use my site. And here's why because I pushed it and went fast and just ignored all the advice I got in the beginning. Oh, you can't build something like this. It's impossible. And I just lowered my head and did it. That's the same thing that helped me in a way in the workforce. And now it, it hurt me in a way dealing with people. But when I built stuff like automation and programming, I just did it. I didn't ask questions, didn't ask for permission. You know, I'd rather ask for forgiveness later. You know, the old saying, I'd rather ask for forgiveness later than permission now. And that's how it worked with my site. And I think the benefit that's translated to our fans is just these kids and these parents don't want to sit through a boring lecture. The attention span now has dropped to what? I think last study I read, there was like a hummingbird, which is eight or nine seconds. So imagine that math, which is one of the most hated subjects on the planet or one of the most misunderstood, you're going to throw a lecture and a huge book at a kid and all they want to do is just learn how to solve the problem. So I took my impatient nature and I just put it on the site and I said, here's the fastest way I know how to solve this problem. Here's the easiest. And not only that, like the kids don't have to go through a lecture. They can just put their problem in or even a search term. If they want to learn more about equations, they type mm -hmm. equation, click go. Here's the calculators. Here's the explanation and, you know, no wasted time. So I'm a big fan of optimizing time and, and reducing waste. And I think that's my big why for building this site is, I know as a kid, when I sat through classes, I don't want to sit through a two hour lecture. Like, give me, give me the cheat codes. Give me the fast method. How do I solve this problem and how do I improve? Yeah, for sure. And that, yeah, that attention span is, I mean, I've heard every, anywhere from as, as low as three seconds. Now I, I think, you know, I think, um, it kind of goes from the marketing side of things, you know, everybody says, uh, oh, yeah, attention span to three, nine seconds. You know, you got you to gotta get the message across. I, I think you need to attract them to continue in that time period, right? Because obviously, um, <clears throat> if you see a message going by on your, on your feed or your Google, there's a Google ad or something or uh, a search result, you have three, or th that three to nine seconds, whatever it is. Um, maybe, maybe the newer generations is going slower. <laughs> lower <laughs> you know <Right. laughs> um but you have that time and i think that time is this is what's going to this is how much time you have to make them read that little message to continue on and and to learn more you know because i mean i know i'm the same way my attention span is i mean i read a lot but i only read what i want to read right so you know i i think at in the past when people had longer attention spans they may be more patient to sit there and read a bunch of stuff that doesn't pertain to them in the hopes that they're going to find something. But today it's like, okay, that attracted my attention. Let's check it out and do a quick scan. Okay. Now and on to the next thing. Right. And then once you find that you, uh, you continue to, to learn and watch the video or read the message. Right. But you know, in terms of learning for, for children, I, I, even when I'm planning out this homeschooling season for, for my children this year, you know, we're trying to incorporate more, um, more hands on more projects, uh, you know, to kind of apply, you know, I might spend 15 minutes teaching them something and say, let's go do a project now to, to kind of uh, learn that rather than just, you know, back when I was in school, it was just sit in the classroom at your desk for six hours and okay, go home and spend another three doing homework. 
right. you know, and you and, and you probably understood the understood the equation uh, you learned that day and how to solve it, and you could do it in, in five questions, you know. But they had fifty questions for you to do, right? And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, that's um, definitely in, in patience, right? Impatience is a quality uh, in the right scenarios, and I think for entrepreneurs, that's uh, important. It, it sounds you you kind of took that ready uh ready fire aim approach right you just kind of went and did it and then you kind of readjusted after yeah i mean i did the same thing when i was a programmer it's just how do i build this how do i automate it how do we make things faster better cheaper and i took that same mindset and plowed it into the to my site and i mean it took a couple years but after the third or fourth year we started getting a little traction and then the graph turned from linear to exponential and it's been a great ride ever since yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, have you ever read that book, Ready Fire Aim? I think is that by uh, Michael Masterson. Masterson. Michael Masterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's pretty. I'm good a huge book. fan of Agora, so I bought all Masterson books, Bill Bonner's books, all the all the all those guys. They're incredible. Yeah, yeah, they uh, put out some good stuff. I think I read quite a few of Michael Masterson's books there. Uh, his, was it his real name's something Ford? Henry or Mark, Mark Ford, Ford, right? Mark Ford, Mark Ford. and Henry yeah. Ford made the cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark Ford. Yeah, oh, awesome. Okay, cool. So, um, we kind of you know I introduced you uh, as achieving the the fastest math solving site and three point eight million unique visitors, but. Um, it, would you kind of want to expound out a bit on that, on what your greatest business achievement was or even a personal life achievement that you'd like to talk more about? Yeah, I mean, you and I talked earlier about the attention span. And so one of the things I did is it took years to get strong with search engine optimization and to get Google to start pushing us higher and higher, which is how we get a majority of our traffic next to word of mouth. But, you know, one of the things back to the attention span is, Google's got this thing called pogo sticking. And I talk about this in my SEO book, but what, what they're looking for is if you search for something on Google, you click into their result and then you try out the site, whatever they suggest, and you click back, it's called a pogo stick. Well, Google's algorithm recognizes that as either A, the site you clicked in on didn't have what the user wanted, or B, what you and I just took a, talked about, it, it took too long to get it. If we go back to the hummingbird statement and we take nine seconds as the attention span, as soon as the user clicks in to, let's say, my site, the nine second clock starts. So whatever time is eaten up with the page loading and for them to find what they need, that takes off the attention span. And so one of the things I did is just speed the site up and make things easy to find where when a user clicks in, they can just drop their problem in and go. And so if it only takes one second or less for the page to load and one second or less for the calculation to load, they've got six or seven seconds left to look through the math and figure out, yes, this is a site I want to learn more about and I'm not going to pogo stick back to Google. Google picks that up and now these kids are staying on the site longer. The parents are staying longer and it's almost like a positive feedback loop, right? So if they stay longer, they invest more time. The more time they invest, the more time they're likely to invest. The same thing as if, you invest in a friendship or in a, you know, an investment fund or a stock. If you've been with it long, you're going to stay with it longer. And so that positive feedback loop and tiny little changes like that have, have turned our site into, you know, the traffic we get now, which last year was 3.8 million. This year with the virus and digital learning exploding, we're on track for 5 million. So I'm a, wow. to expound on your question is this, I'm a big fan of the, the uh, saying, small, small hinges swing big doors. And that was one small hinge that we made the change to our site and we, we saw a huge benefit. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, I really like that, that term pogo stick. Uh, I guess you're kind of talking to kind of like bounce rate, right? Like the, how fast they bounce off the site. So right. For, for, for other people to kind of compare that to the, but I like the pogo stick analogy. It's like, yeah. And uh, no, I don't, I like this. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, yeah, it's or in Google's stay. patent. So Google filed a patent for their search engine. That's how I found it. I talk about it for the search engine is it, they call it pogo sticking, right? Because oh, you're they, jumping okay, in actually, and then you're jumping back. Yeah, that's where I got that term. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're talking a little bit about SEO there and you said you had a book 
and as you wrote a book on SEO. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I, I wrote two books. The first was the first one was just about my site, how I got started, as well as thousands of math shortcuts and and mindset tips you can use to get better at math. And then the second book was called Free Traffic Frenzy, and that's everything I've learned over 13 years, including the dumb mistakes I've made for how to get a higher search engine rank. And I mean, the basic message with, because if you talk to people about SEO, a lot of the, the thought out there is like SEO is this magic black box that nobody knows anything about. And Google's running all this secret stuff in the background. But the overarching message of the book, which would help anybody who's starting a business with a website is, a lot of people think you have to make the algorithm happy and the people will come, but really it's the opposite. If you make the people happy, it's Google's job to serve up your site higher and higher because it makes Google look better. So relevant search mm. results to get the job done. So make the people happy and the algorithm will, will reward you. Yeah, I think, I think Google has over the years really increased the quality of their algorithm to, to focus on keeping their, their users happy. And I remember back, I don't know, probably even five years ago, it was all about putting up all these quick uh, micro sites just to get people to check out this product and they can go click on this affiliate link, you know, and, and Google says, Google catches on, right? And they say, oh, I'm going to change it. And then all those people, all those sites went down. But if people had built a site that was valuable from the beginning, right, that people legitimately wanted to come back to over and over again, right, Google's going to push it up. You know, and, and I know they talk about backlinks and all that and you get backlinks and that's helpful. But I think there's also uh, an element of, you know, you need to organically build backlinks. That's, that's my opinion. Organic, that means people saw value in what you offer and wanted to link to your site rather than just dropping backlinks all over the web. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's some people who say that works and they, and they offer that as services and that's, that's fine. I'm not going to say it doesn't work, but personally, in my opinion, you know, if you can build backlinks organically and have people, you know, link to your site because they think it's valuable and helpful to their people, then Google's going to see that, you know? So yeah, no, I, I think I'm definitely, I'll link to your book in the show notes so other people can find it. I think that seems, sounds very helpful. It's uh I'm going to probably get myself a copy of it too. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not a big SEO guy myself as in technical, very technical. I do for myself. I do simple things like, Oh, I'll go look at uh, keywords and keywords surrounding a keyword just to see. I, I do more for content research, right? Just to see what people want to learn about. And then you just put that in your, your article in a natural way. And, and that's about as far as I go and meta tags and things like that. But, um, you know, if people are, are seeing it as valuable and keep on going back to it or, or linking to it, then, then Google's going to see it. Right. So right. sounds like you, uh, definitely know a lot about that. And, and math celebrity is at the top of a lot of search terms around math. I went and checked it out and it's like, oh, there it is. I know that, I know that guy that made that site. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool. So you definitely know what you're talking about when it comes to SEO, I guess, and that's kind of going into the uh, the marketing side of the show here. So uh, many business leaders don't often consider themselves marketers, but I think we can all agree that in order to succeed at business, you need sales. And whether a business owner realizes it or not, they are doing something to market themselves and make those sales happen. So, Don, what does your business do to market itself? SEO is our big one and that took years to build. And then the second one is just word of mouth. So we, we've got a social share widget on all our calculators and if people find value, they share it and the link they share usually runs the problem. So if they've got classmates, for instance, and the classmates are working on homework and one of the classmates on Facebook shares the answer and the work to say two X minus nine equals 31, the other 24 students can click in there that the link will run the problem and show the step-by-step -step work and then they all get to see it. Well, what happens next? Even if two out of the 24 students were impressed, maybe they go share it and here comes the positive feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So SEO is number one, uh, word of mouth number two, and then I'm, I've been pretty heavy on LinkedIn the last couple of years. So that's another almost indirect way when people connect with me, the first thing they see is, creator of the fastest math tutor on the planet. And that instantly 
either does one of two things. The first is I want to see if this is true and tell me more about it or B, I don't believe a word you're saying until they click in, read and go to the site and then they say, okay, now I do believe you. So LinkedIn's been really helpful just getting the word out there as well. Yeah, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of surprising actually. Uh, you know, we always talk, and this is just, this just goes to um, the fact that you can't always assume where your audience is hanging out, right? So a lot of people would say, I mean, my assumption would be that Facebook would be the best place for you to find. And, and you do, you do have your, you know, your, your, uh, the people looking at your site, um, sharing that on Facebook, say with their classmates. Right. But, um, to, to think that something that is built to help students is doing well with say LinkedIn, that's, you know, I wouldn't have assumed that that would have been the case, but it seems like you, you are <laughs> finding your market there. So. Yeah, the parents are reading and then they'll go show the kids or they'll just use the site secretly so they don't have to go to the textbook, learn the math and then go teach their kid because they look like a hero. And then as far <laughs> as Facebook, it's funny you mentioned that because the one ad we ran, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with voyeur marketing, but there's this tool called text video, TXT video, and you can program a text message conversation between two imaginary people or like an avatar of your customer and somebody else. And so one time I did a $5 a day Facebook ad using a text video chat between two moms. And I don't know why, but that ad crushed it because it was just like two moms having a text conversation. And the one mom says, Hey girl, what's going on? I'm, I, what's that site you use to get your, your Johnny's homework done in 10 minutes. And she goes, Oh, math celebrity, just pop your problem in there and, and you'll learn it instantly. And she says, thanks girl. And the text ends. And we got so many page likes and so many clicks from that ad, it just blew me away. And I don't know if it was because the way the conversation was structured or text videos, you know, presentation, it's almost like you're spying on two moms having a conversation and you get to learn this secret like math site that you didn't know about before. But I've got to explore more of that because that was surprising to me. Well, I, I can see what you did there. You entered into their story, right? So right. anybody, any mothers that saw that ad, they're like, that's, that's what I'm going through. That is the story I'm in. And it's, it's super relatable to them, you know, and you, and, you, and you entered, you met them in their story where they're at. So that's, I can see why that would have crushed it. Cause I'm listening to that. I'm like, that's genius. That's some genius ad right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Um, yeah. And, and have you explored like, uh, it's kind of something I was thinking about with Facebook ads. You know, there's a lot of times people will go to Facebook ads and they'll run people straight to say a, a lead magnet or to a, a you know a, a low low tripwire type offer. But how about the idea of you're talking about a lot of likes and a lot of follows there? Do you think that may be more beneficial to build up followers and getting those likes so that any future content you post on say your your page would just Facebook would just display it for people that have liked and followed you previously. Has, has that, have you seen any benefit to that? Yeah, we did a little bit of retargeting back in 2018 with an ACT SAT campaign. So what the campaign was, it would give them a free handout, give them the option of the call. But if they didn't schedule the call or come back to the site, we had a, we had a custom audience built where the ad would then retarget them and say, Hey, you forgot your free consultation or you forgot your, 15 minutes to get more $5,000 and more financial aid. And I think the retargeting after three or four times, our message started seeping in. Mm -hmm. And then there's another tool, which I I've consulted on. I haven't used it for my site yet, but I've used it on other projects is, uh, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. It, uh, anyway, what, what this tool does, it, not, not Quaya. Quaya is a powerful tool where you can run like 50 different variations and I'll do auto split tests, but, the name may come back to me. But anyway, what this tool does is you run a Facebook ad. Let's say we're talking about SATs, right? Which is a timely a once a year thing. We're talking about maybe selling your house. What, what this does is it sits on Facebook in the background quietly. And if it hears anybody talk about like the word realtor or struggling with the SAT, the second they say that when the feed refreshes on Facebook, your ad serves up. And so it's almost like a listener listening for the conversation. And as soon as the conversation happens, 
it's serving up the ad versus the traditional Facebook ad. You target somebody and they'll see the ad instead of, it's almost like listening for the conversation. When it happens, boom, here's the ad. So I've, I've, I've seen some powerful case studies with that. Um, just is, the is, timing. Is that like, uh, I think I've heard of that before, but is, is that, that's not Facebook. That's kind of like one of those ad additional extensions, right? Right. So there's an API in the Facebook and mm -hmm. Again, you, you program the targeted keywords or conversations and then it shows up, the, it serves up the ad. I'm trying to think of the name. If I remember it after the episode, I'll, I'll send it to you because I've got it written down somewhere. That's not Ad Espresso, right? Is it? No, Ad Espresso no, that's, is... That's that another great easier. site. Yeah, right. that's what's making it easier for people to use it. Uh, no, I think I've heard of something like that. It was something like Whisper, wasn't it like, uh, or something Whisper Spy or... Ah. I don't know. I'm just guessing now, but I think I've heard of that tool you're talking about. And I, yeah, that's uh, you're entering their conversation, right? And so that, that's what makes people think that Facebook is watching you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. If you're on their site, they're watching you, right? Oh yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, so, okay, so I guess we kind of talked about this ad. I don't know, would you consider that ad, the conversation ad, the text messaging ad to be the most effective marketing you've seen? Or is there something else you'd like to kind of go and expound upon? Yeah, for the three or four, we haven't done much paid ads because we've, we've been so spoiled with SEO, but out of the four or five ads I've done, that, that, that voyeur marketing with text video just crushed it. And, I'm going to re-explore that at a later date with another campaign, but that, that far and away, the click rate and the engagement, I mean, even the comments and the shares, you know, moms were sharing it to other moms. And then there was in the comments section was, Hey, has anybody used this site? Which is great because then if somebody has got to come in and answer say, no, why don't we check it out? And it just, it just, the positive feedback loop keeps cranking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Make sure you send me a link to that too. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, We'll, we'll get we'll get that information in the in the email or something after, but yeah, it sounds like you got some great tools there for people to explore. Um, so I mean, we obviously know kind of your your target market is is the parents of children and and children trying to solve their their problems, right? Um, how do you how do you focus in on them? Like, do you have uh, a profile that you use or? what's kind of your methods to focus in on communicating with these people? So I, the people that hit the calculators, I'm not asking for an opt-in right away, but there's links to drive them either back to the home page or I've had other resources, which will collect their email, but I like to do email. And then some of the, I've got a 35 day autoresponder sequence and the call to action is always either buy a product or connect with me on social media. And then on top of that, the share tool I use, it's called Shareaholic. I've got a widget on there where when the share is done, it'll offer them the option of, hey, thanks for sharing this. And oh, by the way, would you like to connect, right? Because it's that two-step marketing instead of asking for everything up front. Let's connect. Give me your email. Do this. Do that. They do the share. And then it's almost like in the middle of the activity, oh, by the way, hey, here's my LinkedIn if you want to connect. So I'm getting connections from... The footer on my autoresponder emails, I'm getting connections from the Shareaholic part two sequence. I'm getting connections from even in my forum. So I've got a forum which answers longer form problems that I can't have the calculator do. Well, there's links to my book because it's basically me doing all the posts. So there's links to my book, links to LinkedIn and other resources. So I've seen people coming in from there. And then the other one that, that kind of shocked me besides text video was I like to answer questions on Quora but the questions I'm answering have nothing to do with math. It's more of just like the corporate career and the being a cog in the wheel. Well, at the end of those answers, like some of them have gotten a couple hundred thousand views. There's a call to action. Hey, if you want to continue the conversation, why not connect with me on LinkedIn? And so immediately I get people connecting on LinkedIn that will start talking about the corporate world. And then, Oh, by the way, I saw your math tutor. My kid needs help. And so that's how the mm -hmm. conversation starts. Yeah, you kind of got that that uh, unique advantage of, uh, you know, there's a lot of kids out there, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, you never, 
you know, so many people you talk to, you might not know if they have kids or not, but most of the time they probably do. And math has always been that subject that is universally uh, difficult to to teach and understand, right? So uh, for most people, I mean, there's some kids out there just geniuses. <laughs> I wasn't one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and so you're you're looking more for social media connections right facebook and linkedin you're, you're asking them to connect with you follow you um on those platforms and when you're asking and you're using that share feature to kind of use the momentum right that they're sharing let's use the momentum and connect at the same time so that's uh right yeah that's pretty smart momentum is uh if you can use momentum right it's it's a powerful uh tool i guess you know kind of like is it you know, karate kid <laughs> right you use their weight against them right <laughs> right exactly <laughs> yeah cool um okay so let's get into uh the sadder side of the show i like to call it the it's what marketing effort efforts aren't working or that you've tried and it and it failed you know we all, we all know that failure leads to success eventually if you keep on trying so Let's talk about those, uh, those flops. So the biggest failure that I can tell you, and it's always all, always embarrassing for me to, to say this, and when I talk to consultants or people who ask about the site, is with three with 3.8 million visitors and, and a subject that everybody needs help in, you, you would think that we were making seven, eight figures easily, but the, the fact is we're not. And the problem is, we're just not converting sales. So I can't tell you how frustrating it is rewriting a sales page, rewriting a video script, cleaning up the language on an opt-in page. Our opt-ins go up, they read more emails. My latest sales letter version that you and I talked about, I've got 28% of people reading all 5,000 letters all the way to the bottom, but they're not buying. And we've just struggled for years to get people figure out why they're not buying. And so over the last nine months, I kind of had a revelation like what what am I doing wrong and then when I go back to all the copywriting books the marketing materials you know I've only been studying for three years but I've been doing it pretty intensely is like I've got all the pieces you know the guarantee the testimonials all that but the one thing that I'm not doing and, I, and I've still not done right is get the emotional pain points of the buyer so the parents the students why, why do they need help with math? And it's not just to get the math homework done. Like I, you and I were talking about this a bit. This, this shocked me is when I did the fifth rewrite of the sales page, it dawned on me, like what, what do moms and dads on Facebook, they're bragging, right? They love to brag, you know, junior got in the Yale or, or they'll do the humble brag. They'll post a picture of the acceptance letter. And so when I went on Facebook posts, a big pain point with moms is not being able to brag about their kid on Facebook when the other moms are bragging. And so I'm slowly incorporating that in my sales letter to see if that will increase conversions or maybe tip them over to buy. But to answer your original question, it's just like sale, sales conversions has just been a bane. It's just been a pain in our side. And we've tried a lot, we've worked with some consultants, but we're not there yet. I think we're getting more people to consume the entire message, but they're still not pulling the trigger to buy. Yeah, and so have you ever checked out uh, Donald Miller's story, Brian? I saw some of the free material. I got to buy that. That's next on my list. I recommend that's, that's kind of like where, where I like to, to go with my own writing, my own marketing is, is that story, right? It, it's so powerful. And I think I'd kind of talked to you a bit about that before with, with your copy there about, about the story and telling the story and you, you have all the stuff you need there. You just, if you can just structure it in a way that it, it just, they feel like they're in that story, right? I, I, I'm, I'm positive you'll see some great uh, results there. So but I definitely recommend checking out Donald Miller's book, uh, Story Brand. And even he just released another one recently called The Simple Marketing. I, uh, I recently just bought it, so I'm going to read that too. But it's, it's um, definitely, I'm pretty sure it would be quite helpful to you. Yeah, I'll have to check uh, that out. And totally random comment, I figured out the name of the software that does the listening it's called needles n-e-e-d-l-s okay. needles n-e-e-d-l-s okay right. cool <laughs> yeah i will post uh, we'll post that in the show notes too so people can uh check that out 
you're having some trouble with conversions. You guys are working on that, increasing your, trying to increase the, um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that the fact that you got people reading down to the end is very impressive, right? And you were talking about using like, we're using Hotjar or you're using hot, is it a hot map, right? To, 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 to see how, where people are spending time on the page, right? Yeah, they're scrolled up, with, which is a Google Analytics plugin. And then I use Kartra as my CRM and my sales page. And they have a built-in heat map where you can see how many people are making it to the bottom. So no, that's, that's, that's what we're using. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. You got, you got people reading down to the bottom. And you know, the thing is, is that sometimes most sales letters, big sales letters, you know, people will check out the top, they'll scroll all the way to the bottom, then they'll scroll back and, and you know, jump jump all over the place, right? So the fact that you have this readership that is interested enough to go through it all, that's that's pretty good. That's that's unique. So you're definitely on the right track. <laughs> Hope to break um, it wide open one day. <laughs> it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen. You, you you have a lot of traffic to test with, so yeah. <laughs> It'll happen. So what have you learned about marketing your product or service since entering business, right? I mean, obviously at the beginning you had ideas on how things should happen. And then over time you, you adjusted, you've tested, you um, tried new techniques, um, maybe adjusted your strategy. What's, what's kind of that uh, story there? If I could go back in time, 13 years, when I started this project, I would lock myself in a room for about an hour and just put one statement on repeat, go learn sales, copywriting, and marketing now. So build your site, because I would spend sometimes when work was over like six, seven, eight hours building it for years, but I never spent any time on the promotion because the big mistake I made was, hey, if you build it, people will come. And then in the sixth year, sixth or seventh year when we started actually promoting it, hey, we got this thing, people are excited, just throw up a credit card, opt-in form sales page and we're good. And no, that's not how it works. So if I could go back, I would learn all the things I've been studying the last three years. It's just like emotional pain points, sales and persuasion and why Gary Bensavengo, legendary copywriter had a great post on his marketing bullets where he talks about what are we really selling? And so when I dig in, I just started doing this, digging into the emotional pain points of why people are really buying and one of the things I learned is I changed my homepage probably seven times. And when I added this phrase I'm about to tell you, the opt-ins shot up and people started reading more emails. And I, I talk about heal math anxiety in two clicks because up until the seventh version of that homepage, it was, oh, we could solve your problem in a split second. We got all these calculators, finish your homework in 10 minutes. But it didn't, it didn't pierce at the root of, what is the real pain here? And so if you look up math anxiety with students, these kids are embarrassed to have to ask their friends for help. They're embarrassed when the teacher calls on them. They're, they second guess themselves with, with simple problems like two plus five because there's that, there's that mental association of I'm not good at math. And then that leads to anxiety. And as you know, anxiety changes their physiology and now they're freezing up on quizzes, they're freezing up on homework. And it's affecting their home life, right? I mean, the parents are expressing frustration too. It's like some of these kids, when they start math, they completely change. It's like they just freeze up. And so when I addressed math anxiety in two clicks, it, it seemed like a, we, we jumped a, a huge hill. Like we started getting, I think it was like almost 30% opt-ins. And some of those are parents, some of them are older kids. But the point being, heal math anxiety speaks to what we're really, or, or almost to what we're really selling. And that's, we're removing the stress and we're installing confidence. Cause really one of the things I saw on my site is not math tutoring. Like I was saying, it's confidence. If these kids had confidence, their internal state would change and they would be more apt to, to, to learn and not shut down when they see math. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and, and you, and you boiled it down to kind of a simple statement, right? And that's, that's clarity. So I mean, you don't want people, jumping on your site and what exactly do these guys do? I mean, you boiled it down, right? Solve math anxiety in, in two clicks. So that's, uh, that's awesome. That's, uh, that's right there. That's a story brand thing that Don Miller talks about, right? Having that, that statement that just, this is what we do. And it's not, not fancy. It's not, um, what do you call that 
spiced up or, or, or fancy words, <laughs> hyped up. It's just, this is what we do. So here's your pain and this is how we're solving it, right? So this is what we do. So yeah, I like that. That's good. Yeah, and learning about uh, marketing, uh, copywriting, sales copy. I mean, that's uh, definitely, I, I think there's not enough people out there that really understand the power of that or or how it can be you know a lot of times people say oh it's just just some words on a paper right it, it, it's how's that how's that very how's that powerful but you know using the right words is i mean those people have made millions of dollars just using words right <clears throat> you have gary Benzabanga, right there's um dan kennedy uh joe sugarman with his catalogs uh john capels you know some of the big the big names uh what's the what's that other guy i can't believe i'm blanking out right now bond. halbert bon, uh, gary halbert gary halbert his son's bond halbert that's right right bon Halbert's his right son. gary had gary halbert i mean that guy was writing uh letters from prison <laughs> you know and making in millions you know uh and, and he wrote letters to his son right while he was in prison now I'm not. I don't know why he was in prison, so let's not go in there. I have no idea, but apparently, I'm sure there's a story that's out there. Uh, but he was in prison. He was writing the letters to his son, teaching his son how to make money with sales copy, right? And now, and now Bond has his own his own uh, business around that. Uh, but yeah, like that's the power of words, right? Um, and and used used correctly, it's you can run a whole business just off of that. <clears throat> Well, you talk about Halbert. I mean, when he was alive, he wrote, I don't know if your audience knows about him, but for those that don't, I mean, he wrote that family insignia letter that was like, I think it's 300. Yeah. Right. The, the crest, right. That was 325 words only. And that thing brought in a hundred million in 1980s money. And at one point he needed 25 women working part time to cash all the checks at the bank from 320 yeah. something words. So that just speaks to what you said is like, that's the power of words. I mean, I, I, Halbert's such an influence on me for copywriting. I took how to make max money in men time. That books 140 something pages. And I hand wrote out everything to just groove that into my head. And I mm -hmm. sent it to bond on the Gary Halbert Facebook group, because just the lessons that Halbert knows about how to sell people and through the words, the right arrangement of words can change your life. So I agree with you. Yeah, exactly. And you, you think about it as, I mean, obviously sales people, people, salesmen and salespeople who work in the sales department are important as well. But, you know, if they, if they understood copy as well, I mean, cause you gotta think a lot of people in the sales departments have scripted conversations, right? They, they're, they're, right. they're trained to say things in a certain way to certain responses. And I mean, they have the advantage of being there up front, hearing the responses and giving the appropriate response back. But, um, if they understood copy as well, I mean, that's going to increase their sales script. That's going to increase their ability to um, pl plan out uh, a conversation. And, and so, I mean, it fits into everything, right? Um, and, and the power of words too can be good to, go, to go as far as establishing business values and how you want your company to run and how you want your employees to, to see how the business runs right with your mission statements, your value propositions, you know, if everybody's aligned on that with the right, uh, right words, you can really inspire a great culture in business too. So it's, it's a lot more important than just words on paper. And so I'm, I'm happy to talk with you and, and talk to somebody who understands that, right. It's, uh, it's very, uh, enlightening <laughs> or we call that. And yeah. Oh, I love this uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the you talk with the copywriters and copywriters and people that love this this stuff can stay up for hours talking about it, right? Everybody else is falling asleep, <laughs> but we're all up late at night talking about words. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess I mean, you kind of talked about some of your frustrations. Uh, you know, the conversions. You're trying to get those conversions. You have a lot of traffic. Uh, is there anything? You, you want else you want to talk about in terms of frustration, something else that bothers you today in regards to growing your business or. Yeah. yeah. I think the one to address that frustration and I just found these about two years ago, they're called mental models. So if you go on the news and you read about Elon Musk or Warren Buffett or 
you know, some of the people that are captains of industry, it's not so much that they're smarter than others, which sometimes they are, but they use these tools called mental models. And the one thing that's helped me unscrew mistakes or start correcting things like sales and or SEO when I used to make mistakes and not know what I'm doing is one of the mental models, by the way, are ways to think about thinking. So the 80, 20 rule is one of them. I'm sure your audience has heard of that, but the one that I absolutely love is called inversion. And so Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger talks about this all the time. And inversion is basically if you're learning a new skill or something's going wrong and you're trying to figure it out, <clears throat> instead of trying to figure out what to do and Charlie Munger calls this seeking brilliance, it's far easier instead of seeking brilliance to avoid stupidity. So what inversion does is it looks at your problem or challenge backwards and, and it says, instead of trying to figure out what's, what's right, think about all the things you're doing or thinking that are getting in the way. So if we go to sales, for instance, and I look and I see that I'm not making any sales, this is a couple of years ago, the first thing I saw was, well, the language on the page is confusing. If I go to all the copywriters who I started reading years ago that I look up to, every single one of them, Agora, Halbert, Ben Savenga, all those guys talk about writing at a sixth or seventh grade English, English level or below. So the software we use, is, it's called the Flesh Kincaid Calculator, and it will grade readability on your language. So you could have the exact same message, right? But using inversion, what, what would I do to screw up a sale? Well, I would talk above people's heads. I would write huge words that people don't know. Uh, I would drone on and on, and I wouldn't have a clear message. So instantly, when there's been times, even in, even in emails, if I clean the language up to sixth grade, I'm getting more people reading and staying longer. And so inversion has been powerful for me because like Charlie Munger did an interview once and he said, people don't realize Warren and I aren't geniuses. It's just easier for us to avoid stupidity rather than seek brilliance because the, the thought process with inversion is if I start eliminating all the stupid stuff that's going to get in the way, eventually I clear away all the garbage and I find, I find paradise. I find the right way. Mm -hmm. Tipping away for that diamond, <laughs> moving yeah. all, the, all the excess around it. Yeah, no, that's, I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah, I've never, I've never heard of that before. The, 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 we, you said the, it's the mindset models or the mental, mental models. Oh, mental models. Yeah. Right. No, that's yeah, that's cool. I'm probably going to do a little bit more research on that myself. It's if you if you have a great uh, uh, link to that, to a resource, more about that, just send that to me, and I'll put that in the show notes. If you know yeah, there's a great blog that he does a, an incredible job on inversion. If you don't want to buy the books, it's called Farnham Street, F-A-R-N-A-M Street blog. And he, he does a lot of research like with Charlie Munger, Elon Musk, and he has all kinds of mental models about those guys, like the way they think and how they broke through. So that would be the number okay. one resource, Farnham kinda like, Street. Uh, kind of like little uh, case studies on each of them. Right. Oh, okay, cool. That's awesome. So just a few more questions here, and then we'll wrap up the show. Uh, I, I like to ask this fun question for, for all the guests here. Um, every entrepreneur has a dream of their future when starting a new business adventure. What was your vision? How did you see yourself in the future? And how is it different today than what you thought it would be back when you started? My vision was my website tutors my website is basically the google for math for the entire world so i was thinking hundreds of millions of visitors coming to my site each and every day running math problems and i don't have to do much for sales i just sit back and the money rolls in i'm on a yacht i got a nice glass of champagne and everything's automated and i don't really have to talk to people and Part of that dreams come true and that we're probably going to hit 5 million visitors this year, but it took a long time and there's been a lot of bumps in the road. And the second is, it, like I said, if I didn't learn sales or marketing, I better, if I could change one thing, I would find somebody that was really strong at sales and marketing to run that department for me. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest change that the biggest wall I've hit is like, you can build something, you'll get users, but if you really want to sell something, you've got to get deep into the human psyche and get deep into people's wants and needs. So that was the big difference. Awesome. Yeah, it's always kind of that uh, you, you, you dream you're going to get into starting your own business and you're going to be chilling out with uh, in a Ferrari and driving a yacht. And then five years later, you're like, 
I'm still here, still struggling. <laughs> <laughs> They lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you still do it because you still like it, right? So. <laughs> uh, cool. So do you have any advice you'd like to give to the audience today? It could be about starting a business, running a business, or, or anything else, like maybe a math math. <laughs> yeah, for, for all the entrepreneurs, and, and this is a real simple piece of advice to follow. It will save you thousands of dollars and many headaches if you're starting a business is instead of creating a product and then going to find a market, I suggest you do the opposite. And this is a mistake I made is go find a market that needs a problem solved and you build that product. You can use your skill set and your passions to do that, but make sure that there's demand. Instead of trying to create demand, it's easier to tap into existing demand. And one of the things that the, the people in Silicon Valley use with the startups is called the MVP. And that's the minimum viable product. So what you do is once you find the market and you find a problem that has not been solved yet or not been solved correctly, you build your product and you test with say $100. Just go buy Facebook ads for five bucks a day, drive them to a landing page and just put your message out there and see if anybody buys. If you could get even one person to buy, chances are that that's, that's a breadcrumb signal that there's other people who would buy that solution as well. And if it doesn't work, all you're out is a hundred bucks and a couple hours of your time. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's spot on advice. Uh, you know, it, it, there's even some SaaS companies, SaaS startups, you know, that serves, serves as a software for the listeners if they don't know what it means. Um, you know, so that'd be like something like, uh, well, I was, I was using it for, for the podcast here. Uh, it would do automatic subtitles. Uh, so that was a SaaS I was using for that. Um, didn't do it as well as I wanted, but <laughs> but just just so people understand, it, it's it's software as a service, right? So some of these SaaS companies, they would come up with an idea of something that they could some work to be done, right? That's their that's their little uh, um, acronym they like to use, work to be done or work. I, mean, I don't know. I, I can't think of from it, but it, that's that was what they do: work to be done. How do we turn that into a software that is a service that people can pay a subscription for to to use? Right. And, and sometimes these SaaS companies to test that, that most uh, minimum viable product would they, it would, they wouldn't have software made yet, but they'd go out and they'd sell it as if they did. And then they'd have some people in the background actually doing the work just to see if people would, would buy it. Right. And, and so they save, you know, a lot of money spending, you know, a lot of venture capital or whatever on a new startup um, that maybe there wasn't a market for in the first place. So yeah, that's uh that's definitely great advice I like to hear on this show. <laughs> right on. Yeah, and the whole, you know, finding, um, finding the market first before the product itself, you know, that's definitely, I think, I think a lot of people run into is that they'll <clears throat> have this great idea where it's, you know, a great invention or a great service they can offer. You know, service isn't so bad because it's like, well, it's just say you offering a service. Um, you can almost kind of back out of that. But some of these guys will go out and they'll spend thousands developing prototypes on these products and then say, okay, let's go find our market and it doesn't exist, right? And right. Um, that's where you kind of do that audience research first, the uh, researching the, you know, doing interviews with people or doing uh, message mining online or checking out the journals and seeing, okay, if my, these are the problems that people are having now, can my product solve that? And if it can, how do I package it? How do I package that offer to this particular market? Because that's, that's another thing too, right? Is you can have an, a, a service or you can have a product, but how do you package it, right? Because this segment over here, this audience segment over here might respond to how you package it a certain way to solve their problems. And then these guys over here, you know, maybe this over here is a B2B where it would solve their problems. Cause you got to package it differently to meet them in their, their story. Right. And, and, and so, you know, use the pain points for the specific segments. So that's, um, yeah, I guess I kind of went off there a little bit off your advice, but I loved your answers. I just had to expand upon it. <laughs> yeah. The best, the best story and going back to Halbert, he tells a story to his students is he, he says, let's create this imaginary restaurant, right? 
what would be the one advantage overall that you would take to succeed in business? And so the students throw out, I'd have the best burger, I'd have the best buns, I'd have the best decor, I'd have the best or the best price. And they all finish and Halbert looks at them all and says, you're all wrong. The one thing you'd want for a new restaurant is a starving crowd, right? Because yeah. it goes back to what you talked about in the, in the middle of the episode, of like the principle of least resistance. Would you rather sell a product to somebody that you have to fight and cajole and argue with? Or would you rather sell a bottle of water in the middle of the desert? I mean, the, the choice is easy. And so I love mm. the starving crown metaphor because that, that will help, you know, up and coming entrepreneurs save themselves a lot of headaches. Yeah, yeah, no, that's for sure. I think, I can't remember the exact quote, and I think it was Eugene Schwartz who was talking about it in his book, uh, was it Breakthrough, Breakthrough Advertising. Um, I, I got to buy that book, by the way, but it's like 250 bucks. <laughs> they don't print it anymore. Uh, that's, that's definitely on my to-do list of books to buy. But uh, I think he was talking about in there is this exact same thing. It's don't try to create demand I don't know the exact quote, but he's saying like, don't try to create demand for a product. Uh, create a product that has demand, right? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, he has a, a better way to say it, and it's I'm sure it's all over the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's channel existing demand, I think is what he says. He's like, you're not yeah. creating demand, it's just you're channeling the existing demand towards your product. Yeah, you know, and I think too, you think of like some of these big companies, you know, you have, um, it's like Apple, right? And they talk about how Apple created demand for the iPhone. I don't think they did. I think they took the demand for something and just offered a product that solved it. And now it seems like they created demand for the iPhone. But once they <clears throat> took the iPhone and, and, and solved the problem that was already there, then it just took off, right? So I, I still don't think they created demand for something. I think they just offered something that was in demand. <laughs> just in a, I agree. In a form of in a form of a different product, right? It's just like somebody says, I need to get to town faster. Give me a faster horse. You ever heard that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. There was demand for something. Nobody even knew what a car was. So some guy comes around, offers a car. Well, here you go. This is faster than a horse. Get in that. Now everybody demanded the car, right? But he's, <laughs> that's that's kind of how I look at it, too. Years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a good conversation. I'm having fun. It's a good one. You heard it here. Excellent advice from a successful business leader, Don Sevcik. What type, what type of name is that? It's Bohemian Czechoslovakian. Oh, okay. So some people yeah. say Sevcik or Sevik. Okay, yeah. So, but over here, over in North America, it's Sevcik. Right. <laughs> okay. Cool. So how can uh, people connect with you? Um, take advantage of your offers. Yeah. The best way to find me is uh, mathcelebrity.com. That's my site it's spelled M A T H celebrity.com spelled just like it sounds. And we've got ACT SAT products or automated math tutoring. And you could just click in the site and check out the offers. And then if you just want to connect and continue the conversation, the best place to find me is LinkedIn. So I'm under D O N S E V C I K. Yeah, and maybe just for the audience, tell me a little bit more about your, your ACT, SAT program. That sounds pretty interesting. I think really helpful to a lot of people uh, who are looking to get their, their children into some great schools. Yeah, so the, the offer is called the Download an Ivy Leaguer's Brain. And basically what happened is I met a, I met a guy who was a top 1% test taker. He graduated from Harvard, and then he continued his career as just helping people crush the ACT and SAT exams. And near his retirement, I was able to get his knowledge on a flash drive and I was able to build a platform, which is basically his brain. So even if you're not that good at taking tests, even if you're not that good at math, the way he walks you through it and through the platform, you only have to spend 20 minutes a day and you can, you can increase your ACT scores by an average of three points and SAT by 150 points. And some of our students have reported that because their, their grades went up so much on the exam, they were able to get $10,000 or more in financial aid. So just imagine what you and your family could do with an extra 10K in your pocket. And that's the power of just getting a few more points on your exams in college and the after effects that it has. So not only that, we, we give you a free consultation with one of the people in my Rolodex, and all they do is help you 
navigate your way through college. So not just the exams, but like filling out all the paperwork. Cause sometimes that takes hours. They'll, they'll cut it down for you. They'll help you maximize financial aid. So there's this whole big package called the ACT and SAT mastery toolkit. And it's basically like the cheat codes to getting the best grades you can on the exam and getting into college with the most money in your pocket. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's life changing for a lot of people, right? To be able to get into those, those colleges. So definitely check out his uh, program there. You guys, it's, uh, it's uh, very unique and very, I'd say very life changing to anybody who can get in on, pro in, in on that program. So, well, yeah, thanks for coming on the show today, Don. It was uh, quite a fun conversation. We'll definitely have to have another one of these. Maybe, maybe we'll, if you're up for it, we can go for another interview someday and we'll focus in on a, on a topic, maybe specific to copywriting or something, you know, for the audience to, to, to learn more on how they can apply to their business. That's, that sounds like something you'd be up for. Yeah, I'd love to do this again. And I had a blast today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good. Great conversation. Great uh, information for the audience. But to my listeners, please help me spread the word and leave a review on whatever podcast or video platform you're listening to the actual marketing show on. It is appreciated and we'll get this valuable content out to those who need it most. And remember to subscribe to the show's channel and click the little bell if you're on YouTube. Awesome. You guys are great. Thanks for listening to the actual marketing show. Cheers until next time. Hey guys, thanks again for watching this episode of the actual marketing show. If you want to connect with me, check me out on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash IN slash Kyler Callahan. If you want to check me out on Facebook, visit my Facebook page at fb.me slash Kyler Writes or Facebook message me at m.me slash Kyler Writes. I'd like to thank SRO for the track Neon Tokyo for the intro and outro music. Check out SRO in the show notes. Hope to see you on the next episode. Bye.